Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. I'm here today to talk about recovering, quotes, lost floppy disks with an oscilloscope. I want to say lost, I don't mean that we can't find the floppy disk, I mean that we have it, and but we're kind of skeptical that we can get the data off, maybe it's damaged or it's just old and decayed. So my name's Chris Evans. Um, I've had a career in security, a fairly low-level discipline, and one of my passions is retro computing. Probably no surprise, also a fairly low-level discipline. Um, here's my email address. If anything in this talk is of interest to you, please do feel free to email me, or if you have some disks of historical interest in particular, but maybe they need recovering, uh, please do email me. I'd be happy to try and help. So yes, this is a talk about um, recovery and um, archival of data. So let's uh, look a little bit about the history of this project. How did I come to find myself trying to recover data off uh, an old floppy disk? And how did I develop some of these techniques we're going to see? Well, um, I grew up with this computer on the left. This is an Acorn BBC Micro. If you're here live at the show, you may have had the fortune to see an exhibit in the exhibitors hall where they have one of these machines for you to see. And um, I didn't have one of these machines on the right. This is an Acorn Archimedes, but I have included it here because although you may not be familiar with either of these machines, these were very UK-centric where I grew up, um, you're certainly familiar with the legacy of the machine on the right. So this um, they, Acorn designed a processor for this machine in-house uh, called, at the time, the Acorn RISC machine, or if you abbreviate that to an acronym, that's ARM. You probably have an arm in your pocket right now, all of you here. So a uh, fantastic uh, couple of machines with a very interesting uh, legacy. Um, one of the games on the, um, so on, on the left is the 8-bit the machine I had. So one of the uh, series of games that was quite popular, uh, well loved, uh, on, uh, back in the 80s was the Repton series of games. Uh, here's uh, Here's the Repton 3 title screen in all of its 8-bit gaudy color. Um, essentially a Boulder Dash clone. You know, you collect diamonds and rocks fall on your head with, with, uh, with fatal results. And on the right is the, is the in-game. So quite a, quite a well-loved game. So it was actually uh, quite a joy when in the last year or so, what showed up but a, a bunch of disks with the source code on it for the Repton 3 game. Um, always very interesting to um, get a piece of history. Uh, you know, it's very interesting to see how games were developed, what the code looks like. Maybe there are some bugs to we can go in and fix. Um, so the author of Repton 3, all of his discs showed up, and um, so there are, there are various games he wrote for the mach this machine. And um, these discs got into the hands of um, my friend Phil Pemberton. He and I, uh, our task was get the data off these discs so that we can go and enjoy looking at it. Uh, so before we get into getting the data off the disks, when I'm, when I'm talking about recovering data from old disks, especially maybe unique disks like these, I do like to talk a little bit about um, disks and drives in case you want to try some of this yourself. So if you're dealing with a unique disk, obviously you might want to exhibit a certain level of care when handling it. Uh, what we don't do is we don't just take some disk we've not really inspected and stick it in some drive we've just got off the, the shelf and, and see what happens. Because if you do that, you might find that this happens. Uh, this was not me that did this. Uh, I, I purchased this disc off a kind person who neglected to mention to me that you can see through this disc. Uh, so this disc, uh, which I have here, if you want to come up afterwards and have a, have a look through the disc, uh, does, does not work so well. Uh, but it's great. It's one of my, my test discs, and I'll, I'll tell you why I still like it, even though it's broken in, in just a minute. But obviously here, um, some friction on the surface of the disc, combined maybe with a Bad, um, a bad disk surface is just stripped off the magnetic particles. Uh, that's bad news for your chances of recovery. Um, here's another pretty picture. Uh, this, this, this was me. I did do this. <laughs> um, this, uh, this disk. I also have it here. It, it came to me in a, a water damaged package, so that uh, means that um, some mold had grown across the disk surface. And what I what I didn't do is I didn't clean that mold off before I stuck this disc in the drive. So instead of me cleaning the mold off the, the disc surface, the disc drive's head cleaned the mold off the disc surface. And that's not ideal because you get like a clump that builds up and that then becomes quite abrasive and can scrape the magnetic particles off the disc. Uh, <sighs> bad news. Um, by some miracle, <laughs> the disc still looks like this, but it, it reads fine. So I, I don't know 
how I've managed to damage that disc so in such a pretty but thorough manner, and it, but it still reads. Um, but yeah, that gave that was a wake up call to me on uh, being careful with discs. So yeah, know your discs um, before you try and read the disc. Uh, check for mold or dirt. You, that can be that can be cleaned off relatively safely. Look for dents or deformations on the outer jacket because if you spin a disc with a with a dent in the outer surface, that dent will will form a um, a pressure point which can, you know, we're back to scraping the particles off the disc surface again. And it's actually pretty trivial to remove an outer jacket, replace it with another one that's fresh if you need to do so. Um, so disc drives, uh, disc drives are also very important. You want to use a drive that you trust because you've used it on discs that are not historically <laughs> critical, that are not unique, and it reads them fine, there's no nasty noises. Um, you trust the drive. You also want to run case off, case off the drive so you can see the innards after, well, before putting in every new disc, especially a unique one, you want to make sure that drive head is in pristine condition. And here we have a picture of a drive head on my, my favorite drive. Uh, this is in a, in a clean state. Um, the drive type matters. There's a lot of different manufacturers of drives and types of drives. Um, this drive's interesting. It's a single-sided drive, so it, it's not ideal to archive, for example, a double-sided disk, uh, but because it's single-sided, it has a certain type of drive head, again, that's that circular blob in the middle here, that is extremely smooth. It's quite safe, or safer than other drives for, for spinning a disk on and transferring minimal friction to a potentially delicate disk surface. Uh, we'll also see later that different drives have different electrical properties at some of their limits, too. That's, um, that's quite important. Um, this is my, this drive, in case someone's interested, is a, is a Tech FB502. Uh, I like it. It is, uh, it is archived a few discs that are in pretty poor shape. So we have a bonus. Um, just to illustrate the point about the drive mattering, I'm going to play the sound effect of just spinning, actually this, this not so, not so well disc, uh, in my favorite drive. Let's just press play here. So that whirring noise is the motor, and you can hear some swishing, it's not too bad, and that, that clicking is the drive seeking to different tracks. So this is a good disk drive, it doesn't transfer too much friction to the disk surface. Um, here's another drive, a double-sided drive, and to be clear, the drive is well maintained, it's fine, it's a good quality manufacturer, it just has different properties of friction with the drive's, drive heads, and it sounds, sounds like this. I don't like listening <laughs> to this sound. Okay, that's enough. It gives me eye twitch because that's the sound of scraping right on a potentially, a potentially historically interesting disc. And again, there's nothing wrong with the drive, it's just, just it has different type of drive heads. Okay, so reading discs. How do we read a disc once we've sorted out the, the disc into good condition and we've got a drive we trust? I really recommend uh, this device, it's called a Grease Weasel. Um, I think it's exceptional for all the reasons listed here. Mostly it's just open. It's uh, open source, no, li no onerous licensing restrictions. It's open hardware, there are no license headaches. Uh, the community is um, active. This, these things are being actively developed. They're friendly. It's, it's just uh, awesome. And the device itself is capable. It outputs to a very clean file format. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't care what type of disk it is. It doesn't care about the encoding on the disk, if it's an Apple disk or a Commodore 64 disk or an IBM disk. It, it just deals in the pulses that the drive outputs. So if the disk is copy protected, it, it, it just it doesn't care. It doesn't even see that necessarily. It just will record the raw pulses coming off the disk drive. It's also inexpensive. Uh, this is my grease weasel here, this picture. And uh, just while reviewing the slides this morning, I noticed, you know, if you look at that square chip in the middle, it's upside down, but you know, surprise, surprise, it's, it's an arm chip. <laughs> they are everywhere. So once you've used this device, a grease weasel, to read a disk, um, you get this file, and there's this tool I really like for visualizing what you've just read uh, called the HXC Floppy Emulator Software. And what this picture here is a view of a single track off the disk. And if you look at the vertical green bars, and one of them's red, but the vertical green bars are sectors on that track. 
and the, those sort of horizontal clouds of black dots, those are the pulse timings coming off the disk drive. And this is a simple encoding, and that means on, on this particular disk, and that means that the pulse timing is either eight microseconds, that's the top uh, horizontal fuzzy cloud, or four microseconds, that's the bottom horizontal fuzzy cloud. And uh, this is a great view because you can tell right away what sort of condition the disk's in. If, if the disk has a strong signal still, those bands of black dots will be tight. If the signal is weakened over the years, it gets fuzzier. Uh, if it gets so fuzzy, like in this one patch of damage you can see, that the drift of these two clouds overlap each other, that's where you've um, lost the ability to discern these pulses. That's data loss. Now in this case, it's not too bad. We actually read this particular track just by trying a few times. Right, one of the reads, the overlap was not so bad, and by using a slightly aggressive algorithm to decide upper from lower, we're able to get this disk off. Uh, so uh, great, we thought. We're going to get all of these disks without any, any hassle. Um, this is another disk I recently recovered, unrelated to the, to the Repton, uh, but this just illustrates um, something I, I was surprised by, the, how powerful cleaning a disk can be. So I got this, this disk, um, a, a minor software release, that but was unarchived, so you know, as an archivist I have to archive it, and I tried to read it and just the top view was my first attempt, and you know, I guess all you need to know really is red is bad, so this is just destruction. <laughs> Um, and those, those clouds of dots have separated and merged with each other, so not readable. Um, so I went and cleaned the disk surface with a cotton wool bud and isopropyl alcohol carefully, um, although they're more robust than you might expect, and then let it dry off, and then read it again, and it went from every track ruinous to every track perfect. So that was just a little bit of dirt on the surface. Uh, it wasn't even visible. It was uh, nothing visibly wrong with the disk, but cleaning it turned it from um, bad to, to good. So that, that, was, that was quite pleasing. And I had to show this slide. Uh, you heard earlier that sort of horrible vibrating, rotating disc sound we just listened to. Well, those vibrations actually come through in the pulses that are coming off the disc drive in a, in a so the, here we have sort of a digital pulses with an analog noise waveform overlaid on top, which you can clearly see, and that, that's, that's, that's the squeak. Um, and you can imagine that, that corresponds to energy being transferred to the disk surface, which is not necessarily what we want. But I was surprised at how strong the amplitude of the audio squeaking came through on, on this particular visualization. So back to the, the disks we're trying to archive, um, things went wrong here. So this, this disk, um, or this, this track here is fine, really uh, pretty, pretty tight bands, and, but then just a complete to generation to noise in the middle of one of those sectors. There's not even anything really resembling a signal there. Uh, and so you can reread this as many times as we want. It's never gonna resolve on, on if we read it a few times. It's just, just it's just the data's just not there. Um, why, what's wrong with this disk? Well, in this instance, uh, just at the physical layer, there's, it's fairly obvious what's going on here. It's just a big dent in the disk. Uh, this is one of the things that you might encounter while trying to recover a disc. Uh, unfortunately, this, the width of this dent is about 10 tracks worth, um, which is unfortunate. That's a, that's a lot of recovery there. Uh, we thought that the dent could be having like a ski jump effect on, on the disc drive's read head. Like, uh, you know, the, the disc drive's read head would hit the, the dent, take off and lose contact and land again. So we, we very carefully flattened this dent out, uh, but it didn't help at all. Just the, in that region of that dent, the, the information's just not there anymore. One other thing that went wrong, and we hit this a few times, is that there's this strange condition where sometimes we found a sector just missing. So, um, if, I don't know if you can see it, but the, there's a, well, you can see the, the white blocks at the beginning where you should see green. Uh, there's a little green strip just before the white block. So the sector header is intact, but the sector body is just, it's just noise. They're really, it's, um, nothing there at all. And that's a very specific failure mode, and we've seen, we saw it a few times, and we'll, we'll come back to what we think was going on there. Uh, but in terms of trying to read that through the, through the grease weasel, yeah, not gonna happen. So at this point, we've got a, a few disks where we're, they're just, we're not gonna get the data using, using a, a grease weasel. Even though it's pretty low level, it deals with just flux pulse timings coming off the disk drive, uh, not gonna happen. Uh, so we need to do something else a bit more custom than using a grease weasel. 
So let's uh, recap uh, briefly how drive electronics work. Um, fortunately, back in the 1980s when you bought the device, it would often come with a manual that would tell you how it worked and how to service it and where to order new parts from. Uh, it's not like that anymore, uh, but I, I'm happy to enjoy the 1980s by, uh, and save myself drawing a slide by using this, um, this diagram from the Teak FD55 maintenance manual. And it shows how a disk drive works in block diagram form. Uh, starting on the left is the magnetic coil. That's the actual sensor that hovers near the disk surface and picks up the signal. Uh, that gives you an analog signal that sort of rolls to the right through a pre-amplifier, because it's a very faint signal, uh, just from, from a little magnetic reed coil. Uh, so the pre-amplifier then goes through a filter to get rid of noise, analog noise, and then another type of amplifier, and then a peak detector, and then another filter, and then this is what comes out of the drive to the grease weasel, this, this read data line, which sort of is a digital pulse every time you, the disk drive thinks it's seen a sort of a peak recorded on the, on the disk. And just what that looks like, again, from the same manual, which is just excellent, um, showing you what magnetization on the disk looks like on the top. You know, the magnets go this way, then they go this way, and every time they change from this way to this way, you get this peak in voltage coming off of a, a reed coil. And then the disk drive circuitry, its job is to try and reliably determine where it thinks those peaks are and send them out as pulses. Um, so, our idea, based on those two excellent diagrams, is that uh, perhaps we can tap into the disk drive earlier in those series of transforms we just saw and get at more data. And specifically, can we use some modern 2020s technology to replace 1980s technology and do a better job at discerning some of those peaks? Uh, it's, our job is made easy by the fact, if we go back here, uh, the preamp output, the second and third rows, have a label TP7, TP8. Uh, that means test point seven and test point eight. In other words, there'll be a pin which we can just clip onto without having to go and, and solder or modify anything at all. And here is my setup for that. Uh, on the left, we have uh, my disk drive, bottom right. Uh, the grease weasel is still in the picture, bottom left. It's not doing the read anymore, but we're using it for control, just because something has to spin the drive up, tell it to change tracks. So it's still very useful to have it doing that. But in terms of getting the data off, uh, the red and yellow wire here are the two analog signal pins coming out of the preamplifier, and that's what we've connected here to the oscilloscope. We've also connected a blue wire, which is the start of track sensor, so that we can just trigger the oscilloscope to start at a consistent point on every revolution. So just three things needed. And on the right uh, is what's the picture coming off my scope. This is what things should look like on a healthy disk. You can see on, uh, the, on the top is the sort of full track view and on the bottom is a zoomed in view of the actual analog waveform coming right off of the disk drive. Uh, it, the, the amplitudes are regular, the peak widths are regular with the exception of some of them being half width and some of them being double width. That's how the, two, the zero bit from a one bit sort of is distinguished. And it, those, those peaks look, you know, look great, conditioned to me, nice and regular. Um, that's what it looks like when things are going well. So we're entering the analog realm now. We can start to look at what some of those faulty disks look like in the analog realm, as opposed to, yeah, as opposed to what the grease weasel was seeing. So here, we'll dive straight into what the dented disk looks like. And unsurprisingly, uh, on the top here, we see that um, we have a strong signal coming in at the start, just before the dent, and in the region of the dent, unsurprisingly, that sort of strong analog signal just collapses down to a very weak analog signal. It sort of recovers a bit briefly in the middle of the dent for some reason, but then uh, collapses again before it slowly starts to, to recover. And on the bottom, we have a zoomed in picture of what the worst part of that faint signal looks like. And you can see on the left of that, bottom picture. At the beginning, you can just look at it and see that the, the peaks are still discernible as um, big, as like wide peak, not so wide peak. Uh, and, then in, and then towards the middle, it kind of degenerates closer to noise. Oh, sorry, before we get into that. Um, but as a human, 
the interesting thing is you notice right away that the uh, the the wider signals, the sort of lower frequency signals, are st the peaks are all still there. And where, the, where there's noise, well, the higher frequency peaks, as is often the case in the analog realm when something's going wrong, it's the higher frequency peaks that often drop off first. They've dropped off, but you know where they are because that's where there's no peaks. <laughs> that's where, uh, so as a human, you can intuit here that maybe the data is still there. But we are at bonus time again. Um, I should say that the software I'm using here to display these analog waveforms once I've gotten them off of the oscilloscope is Audacity, a well-known uh, open source tool for manipulating waveforms, usually audio waveforms, uh, but it's just very performant in zooming and panning very quickly through signals. You can also f apply filters to get rid of noise, um, and also you can play waveforms. So since this is just a waveform, what is, what is disk data sound like. So we have to slow it down a bit because uh, the data rate is 250 kilohertz, which is well beyond human hearing. But if we slow it down, disk data sounds like this. So if that sounds a bit like a modem connecting from the old days, that's probably unsurprising because the, the same encoding techniques are generally used when, when putting digital data into an, an analog waveform. Um, sorry, just make sure that stopped. And the sort of when you hear it go beep boo beep boo, that's it. That's the sort of sync at the start of a, a new sector, so that there's some well-known pattern that you that can you can look for to know when a sector is starting. So back to this dented disk, as I, as I mentioned, as a human, we think we can look at this and tell each peak where it should be. It's either still there because it's a lower, a lower frequency peak or, or missing because it's a higher frequency peak. So um, I tried to write a tool to do this and I wasn't having much luck. So since this was a fairly small patch of missing data, I, I just went and drew, drew the missing peaks by hand. Um, again, you're, you're using an audio editing tool, so you can just put it in this mode, you just draw. <laughs> and I did that, and I then pulled out the, uh, the fixed peaks, and you get data out, but is it the right data? Have you recovered this disk or not? Well, uh, the good news is that this type of um, disk uses a 16-bit CRC, a checksum, so that it, uh, you can check the data you think you've recovered against that, and there's a very low chance you'll accidentally match a 16-bit CRC. And first time we got a match so that was a recovered track and we did that for all of the dented tracks and uh, and we got that disc uh, there was another disc where the signal was weaker but not as weak as the dented disc but the signal had just gone chaotic uh, we think what had happened there is just the brand of disc wasn't so good at, hold, at, at the metal oxide particles holding the magnetization, so the thing had just decayed into like a chaotic waveform, uh, but still a waveform recognizable in terms of where the, the peaks are. So for this disk, uh, the chaotic waveform on the bottom, we, we resolved it with a, the custom encoding algorithm that sort of knows generally in every eight microsecond chunk what to expect. Does it expect just a, um, a lower frequency sweep um, or, or a sort of double, a double peak or a double sweep? a zero bit or a one bit and again we implemented that um, ran it out popped the sector crc match great so let's look at the toughest case we, we took on in our recovery efforts um, again we're looking here at a um, on the top here at an entire track view and again at the analog signal and you can see those sort of two holes at the the left hand side we have an analog signal that goes from pretty robust, um, like around maybe 700 millivolts peak to peak, which is about, about as strong as, as you could hope for, down to just collapsed. Uh, and with the bottom view zoomed in here, we see the signal going in the, in the act of collapsing. It collapses just down to a wobble in the handful of millivolts range. So it's just looking, looking unfortunate. And uh, the, the title of this slide is Erased Discs, because we think we know what happened here. We think that these sectors were accidentally erased. 
That is to say, magnetic transitions in this area were just sort of swept off of the disk. And that's not an operation the disk controller is normally capable of doing. You can't ask it to do that. But if just the, we're not sure what happened, but if, if, a, if the, the wrong pin fails on your, um, on the cable between your, your computer and your drive, which is the right pulse pin, then, um, you know, the, the, mag, the, the disk head magnet will come on, but no magnetic reversals will, will be recorded. Uh, another possibility is that maybe one, the diode, one of the diode bridges could have failed on the disk drive. We're not sure exactly what failed, uh, because um, uh, we, we can't tell for sure, but it is a common mode of failure. We've seen this on multiple different disks, so it's quite interesting. Uh, we did do a test to see if indeed erasure is what happened here, and we did that by just erasing a patch of disk. That's, that's what we're looking at here. So um, on, on the bottom view here, we see a, a zoo, uh, with the oscilloscope sensitivity cranked up a bit, we see what an erased patch of disk looks like, and that's where we've swept the the uh, the disk right magnet across a small patch of disk on, but without record, without asking it to sort of flip its polarization around. And after doing that, um, we're down to tens of millivolts as opposed to usually hundreds of millivolts signal, but it's still there. We erased the disk, the signal is still there. Um, probably not surprising to anyone in forensics, but the signal's still there. You can just, again, we see we can discern the lower frequency peaks much better than the higher frequency peaks. Uh, they do pop out quite nicely after filtering this signal, actually. Uh, but if they didn't pop out nicely, we still know they're there from an absence of peaks. So in the case of um, the really tough disk we're trying to recover, what we think's happened is the sectors were erased, and then it was poor quality media as well. So on top of that erasure 35 years ago, uh, this very weak signal has decayed for 35 years and led to, led to a really terrible signal. Uh, and can we recover it? So now we're into the uh, talking about um, differences in drive electronics. We, while experimenting, we noticed that different drives at the analog level gave us quite different results. Uh, on the top here, we see a signal from a TEAK or TIAC, I'm not sure how, how, how it's pronounced, uh, drive, but a, a very solid, ma solidly manufactured drive, well regarded. Um, it so happens that the test points on this drive are before its low pass filter, so it's, the signal's kind of noisy and, until we filter it, that's the, the middle signal you see. But after filtering uh, in the worst patch of signal on the right, even as a human, I'm struggling to tell you if each peak should be like a, a one bit or a zero bit. It's, it's, the regularity of that peak has, has failed and uh, that's gonna, that's, may or may not be recoverable. Fortunately, we tried the same patch of disk with an older Mitsubishi drive uh, using previous generation technology and just something about it's different. We're, we're not sure what. Um, well, it's probably the preamplifier or the drive head or both based on those being the components prior to us tapping in. And uh, the same patch of disk, the peaks remain generally resolvable, even in the sort of wobble towards the right-hand side on the bottom there. Um, as someone experienced looking at analog waveforms off of disks, I can tell you what those, those bits are. So this is great. We can try different disk drives and see which of them want to give us a stronger signal on the worst patches of data on these decayed disks. So, as a massive floppy disk nerd, uh, it is my duty to own a wide variety of disk drives. And uh, so I tested them all. And what we're seeing here on, on these pictures is the exact same byte of data from a really decayed sector as seen by each of five different disk drives. Um, and you see a wide variety of performance here. Uh, some of them are quite noisy some of them, the amplitude is weaker than the others, and the sort of quality of the peaks varies uh, depending. And as it happens, one of these signals is, stands head and shoulders above the rest in terms of its amplitude and peak quality, and that is the one, one up from the bottom, the Tech FB502, my favorite drive. Uh, now you're starting to see why it's my favorite drive, because it also has that very low friction head for reading disks safely and the best electronic properties that I've found to date. So this is the drive 
that we used to tackle the, 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 worst, the, the worst decayed disk that we were able to try and recover. Um, so given a waveform that is pretty bad even with the best disk drive we found, uh, the question is how do you recover peaks from that wobbly waveform? And um, courtesy of Hector Martin, who got excited on Twitter when I started talking about this work, uh, he took a fairly formal approach using frequency domain analysis and probabilities of a 1 versus a 0 and popped out quite a bit of data. Um, this very interesting analysis which I do not claim to understand. I should probably spend some more time studying this area of signal and analysis. Um, but at the end of the day, with experimentation, the best results we got were with a custom algorithm that involved first very aggressively filtering the signal to get rid of all, all noise. Um, and I think it was Hector that educated me that I needed to use a particular type of low-pass filtering to avoid shifting the peaks around relative to one another and messing up my, my chances of recovery. So you need a linear phase filter. And then we did some time domain peak discarding. So where we know peaks are just too close together to, to be possible because a disk drive encoding just never uses something that close together, we just get rid of those. And then walking the peaks, looking at the timing between them for a zero bit or a one bit. Uh, and since they're still very wobbly after filtering because they're so bad, um, as we walk these peaks, we sort of work out what we think the peak is. And then if it was a bit early or a bit late compared with what, where it should have been, we then adjust the next peak with a certain percentage adjustment to sort of carry that down the chain. And that was able to get us, um, without human intervention, most of the sector data. And where the few places it failed as a human, you sort of go in and look at it and say, oh, okay, I think I know what's going on here. This is the only plausible thing that fits. And you get some sector data and you can check the CRC and we're able to get it, get it to match on on that disk where the, the grease weasel was showing just a, a cloud of noise. We were able to get the data off in the analog realm. So results, well I've kind of already said the results. We so far have recovered everything that we have attempted to recover. That's not to say that we could uh, recover this disk necessarily because it has a hole in it. Or it's not a hole, uh, the, the, the plastic is still there but the, the, the coating that carries the, <laughs> the magnetic information is not there. But that said, we're bullish about the future potential of recovering other disks that have seen uh, moderate damage. I mean, let's, let's call this severe damage. But moderate damage, we think we can recover things. Um, I mean, the tooling is, is very proof of concept. I haven't released it because it's terrible and it's manual and I have to go in and, and, and do it. But uh, if more disks show up to recover, and I'm really hoping that they will, uh, that will result in me um, having to improve the tooling so I'm not doing things manually all the time. So I'm really hoping that uh, people, uh, people find disks that maybe they thought weren't readable and where they think those disks have historically interesting things on them, I'd be really happy to help uh, drive this forward and try and recover those disks. There may be hope where perhaps we thought there wasn't any. Uh, what did we recover? Well, that game, Mr. Uh, Old MacDonald's Farm, it's, um, it's not the most historically scintillating a recovery, but it, it was a recovery, and, and there's, it's an educational title. There's, there's Mr. Mr. McDonald waiting for, waiting for his post to come. Uh, top right, um, the source code, I think that's a fragment of source code from Repton 3, uh, 6502, was the processor in the BBC Micro, so following on from our previous talk, uh, now we get to look at some 6502 code. Um, and in the bottom, um, those are the catalog sectors of one of the disks where the, where the two sectors together were knocked out. Um, I should have mentioned that, that the first two sectors of the disk were knocked out, which is annoying because that's where the, the catalog is on the BBC Micro that tells you where to find the files on the disk, how big they are. Uh, you probably recon could reconstruct it, but it's one of the more annoying sectors to have lost, and we were able to, to recover those. Here they are. Future improvements. So even though we were able to recover the things we set out to recover, we're convinced that if a, if a really historically interesting disk came into our hands and we were not able to recover it with what we've discussed so far, we think we could dive deeper, pull some more rabbits out of the hat to try and get that data. And here is what we think we could do. Um, at the beginning of the talk, we, we talked about how we've replaced some, some parts of the disk drive electronics with 
with modern components, namely a, um, you know, a high bandwidth oscilloscope, or at least high bandwidth re relative to the bandwidths used in the 1980s, what we could do is, is keep modernizing pieces of the read path. And the next obvious thing that we could replace in the read path is the preamplifier. That's the thing that takes a sort of microvolts to low millivolt signal and boosts it up to hundreds of millivolts. Um, so we're tapping, in this project, we're tapping the hundreds of millivolts part of that read chain. But if we wanted to, we could unplug the, the drive read head plug uh, and plug that straight into a modern preamplifier, maybe something from the telecoms industry or, um, or something with, with a suitable uh, frequency response range where, where modern technology has a very low noise and very high, um, very high gain relative to what 1980s tech could do, especially if you uh, put, some, put, some, uh, put some money into, into a preamplifier. So we think we could get a stronger signal just by using a decent modern preamplifier. Um, we also probably could f find, um, find a modern coil that would be made of um, more consistent windings, perhaps, than, than the 1980s technology. Uh, that's less off the shelf than perhaps a preamplifier, but it's something we could look into. Interestingly, uh, we could just spin the disk faster, especially if we, we're satisfied that we've got a very low friction reed coil assembly. That gives us the confidence to spin the disk fast without risking stripping bits of disk off. And this is just physics. Uh, the, the faster the disk goes, the, the faster the rate of change of the magnetic field passing the, the reed coil, uh, and that results in more, a, a larger voltage being, being induced. Uh, we could also read dodgy patches of disk multiple times and try and average them. That seems like a fairly obvious thing to do. We just didn't do it because we didn't have to. Uh, also, it's worth noting that all of the experience we, we got on this project was with five and a quarter inch floppies. Uh, we'd want to gain some experience with three and a half inch or, or eight inch floppies before diving in and, and trying to read those. Um, I'd probably be more bullish about recovering eight inch floppies simply because the, the the larger magnetic surface means that the, there's lower information density and a lower chance that a given piece of damage will have erased all of the magnetic bits, magnetic particles in, in a given region. Whereas with three and a half inch disks, uh, you know, everything's a bit packed more closely in. And just to reiterate, help is offered here. Uh, if, if It's great to be doing this talk here at a museum. A museum's obviously into recovery, restoration, preservation. So if any of you have contacts, you, you know people that have got some old disks where it's not clear if the data's readable or not, uh, I'd love to, love to help if anyone wants help with any of that. And at which time? That brings us on to q and I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that anyone has. Hey, uh, hold on. One second, I think a microphone is headed your way. The microphone is no. I thought, oh, come on. Okay, um, there have been a number of programmable microscopes. Uh, are there any micro uh, oscilloscopes? Sorry, there have been a number of programmable oscilloscopes. Are there any programmable oscilloscopes that have had software released specifically to recover old floppies of any sort? Okay, so the question is Has anyone programmed an oscilloscope? to do this? Uh, the answer is not, not that I have, have seen. The, the programming that we did on this project was after we had got the, the, um, the data off of the oscilloscope. So the processing was done on tooling on, on my laptop. Um, if, if I was doing this project, uh, and I mentioned the tooling is, is in bad shape, it's not reusable. If I was going to make reusable tooling, I, I probably would um, yeah, drive the oscilloscope just in a way where it was, we'd tell it to start capturing, and then we'd stream the data to, to um, a processing pipeline on, on a laptop or, or you know, a modern machine. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't automated that yet. Um, one of the things that stopped me from automating my oscilloscope is that everyone has a different oscilloscope. And uh, yep, a, a follow-up, hopefully, perhaps to tell me how I should, be, should have been doing this. <laughs> follow up as long as he doesn't grab the microphone again. My, sorry, my try is that, uh, is there any package name or names that have been uh, associated with your attempts to recover such data? Um, the software I like to use, I, I mentioned it in the talk, the, 
the processing I've been doing is with Audacity, which is usually an audio editing tool, but uh, we, I use it to edit and, and filter uh, waveforms from the... Audacity. 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 It's uh, typically used to process audio files, things like that, uh, add gain, remove gain, clean up sound. It's, a, it's open source, right? Yeah, it, it, it's open source. There was recently some controversy when, when they were purchased, but I think it's I think it's GPL license. Can I, I see some nodding? So yeah. you can use the the latest quotes free uh, version right. in perpetuity if you wish to. Yep. Cool. I see more questions. I'm going to go to the one close to me, then I'm going to head over to you guys. I noticed you had um, five discs, and you only showed us how you got the te uh, test point after the preamp. Uh, for one of them. Are they all analogous or how did you find those test points? Yeah, a, a great question. So you've got a floppy drive that may be different to the model I showed wired up. How do you find the test points on that floppy drive? Uh, so it is ubiquitous that they have these test points. Uh, this is again back in the days when you were allowed to service your own equipment and you'd be told how to do so. Uh, the test points are all different from different manufacturers, of course. Um, but they usually look like pin headers. Uh, in terms of working out which pin you need, there are data sheets for a lot of the most common drives out there, but each drive tended to move them around a bit as generations of that drive change. So generally, if you know the signal you're looking for, you can just get out your scope and just attach until you see that familiar waveform where you've, you've got that um, waveform at, at the voltage amplitude you expect with the peaks looking like you expect, and, and there it is. So trial and error will fairly trivially get you that, that waveform from any floppy drive. Wow, you didn't even, you said, and there it is. No Bob's your uncle, nothing, nothing like that. <laughs> okay, so I'm heading over here because there are a couple of questions over here. So. Um, great talk, I mean, I, I also tried to revive uh, some floppies. They're the, the three and a half inch, so they're a little more difficult, right, because you need to remove, to, to open up and, and clean up the media, you need to uh, you know, remove that little tab, and, but, but this is great. Um, the question I have is, um, you know, I used to work in the disk drive industry, and so a lot of people make a living out of uh, detecting bits out of a waveform. And it seems to me in the last 20, 25 years since the floppy has really gone away, they, they made a lot of improvement in, in how to do that. And one thing I heard from talking to some of them, they went from peak detect, which is I think what this technique uses, to things like uh, maximum likelihood and things of that nature. So is that something that could be leveraged here? Yeah, a great question. So could we have been uh, used a more fancy algorithm in our peak detection? Uh, absolutely. Um, you mentioned that hard drives moved on from peak detection and use a probabilistic model. I think it's called PRML. Um, I see some. I see some nodding, so I obviously remember that correctly. Um, we we didn't look into that. We uh, we did do some frequency domain analysis. That that was the um, work that Hector Martin tried. That looked at probabilities: is the bit a one or a zero? And that that was pretty good. But in the end, hacking something custom together worked best worked best for this project, but I have no doubt that someone who's an expert in this stuff could come and tell me how I should do it properly to, to be able to recover even more chaotic waveforms. Uh, yeah, question on the cleaning. You talked about you know, cleaning it with uh, uh, alcohol and Q-tip. Mm -hmm. Did you remove it from the sleeve, or how was that done? Can you do it actually without taking apart the, the floppy? Uh, yeah, so for five and a quarter inch drives, as I, uh, discs, as I mentioned, which was what this research was on, um, it's, it, you're in luck because there's no metal shutter to get in your way. You can uh, hold it the right way around. You can just um, swab, the, swab through this window, the surface, and then you rotate it a little bit like that, and then you swab it again, and you go around the whole track, and then you make sure it's, it's all evaporated and then, uh, then the disk is, should be cleaner than when you started. Um, just, to, just a caveat, um, I would, before recommending people do this sort of thing, just in case they've got a really historical disk in their hand, uh, I'm sure there are some disks out there where if you try that, you might, the surface might just start f falling off. So I'd, I'd recommend being a, a little bit careful rather than, just, um, rather than just sort of diving straight in. But it, for a lot of disks I've, I've encountered, uh, the method I just described of cleaning worked because these things are most of these are reasonably robust the surfaces still so be concerned a little bit of ferrite shedding 
Yeah, there are some brands of disc um, that, that are notorious for shedding, like the, they used the wrong type of glue or they were cheap in some other part of the manufacturing process. And that's one thing that I, I would have liked to have got more data on, like this brand, beware, this brand, good. Uh, but that's not some, that's something that's a little hard to, to, to work out, actually, like what brand of disc when they're not, when they're not necessarily explicitly branded. Okay, we had another question down the middle here. So I'd like a little bit of clarification from one of the earlier slides. Um, you, you showed a view of some vertical strips of each sector with, uh, uh, with green, and, green and red. Yeah, there you go. So those waveforms, is this a vertical time slice or are these two different frequencies I'm, I'm just curious as to why there's a, there are two different waveforms stacked on top of each other. Yeah, my apologies if I went a little quick on this part. So this uh, time is running horizontally here. At the far left is the start of the track on, on the index hole, and at the far right is the end of the track. Um, and the vertical axis here is... Well, uh, sorry, yeah, the vertical axis is the time between pulses. So it's kind of like a histogram of timings, I suppose. And um, what this is showing you essentially is that to record anything useful on a, on a, on di a disk with this encoding, you need some eight microsecond pulses at the top and some four microsecond pulses at the bottom. Um, and uh, for example, if you've got a, you can't see it here, but if you've got a track full of zero, a sector full of zeros, then for that sector, uh, only the top fuzzy bit would be present for that sector, eight, eight microsecond pulses. Does that, does that clarify the, the question? Okay. Okay, great. There was uh, another question back here. Wonderful. Hello. So it seems to me that the main problem is you get these patches on the disks where the signal, the ones and zeros are visible to a human but they are no longer distinct enough to be identifiable by the floppy disk controller. Um, have you considered, uh, and you were saying that you were basically manually filling them in, have you considered the possibility of training some kind of machine learning model to, based off of, you know, based off of the um, expertise of somebody who's done this before, and saying, okay, something that looks like this is a one, something that looks like this is a zero, to then get uh, the process to be more automated and therefore more scalable to large numbers of old disks? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So the question is, um, could we use some form of learning model to take the me, the human, out of the, <laughs> out of the process of trying to work out if these, if these peaks are ones or zeros? Um, yeah, that's a great idea. It, that falls into the category uh, mentioned on one of the slides where you know, I acknowledge that the current tooling is pretty poor, but if you know, if the volume of disks that people have to recover increases, then that will by necessity uh, force me to automate things more and um, some, form of, um, some form of model, uh, like an uh, ML model applied to this, almost certainly will do better than some hand-coded algorithm, right? That's the, point of, uh, that's the point of ML models. Are there any more questions? Okay, coming down. We've got time for probably two more questions, so... Yeah, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think one of the things we're running into in from the digital optical era is a lot of DVD and CDR media that's not even 20 years old is suddenly unreadable. So do you think any of these techniques will translate over even though, because ultimately it is just binary in some sense, do you foresee that you know, going forward? Another great question. So do any of these techniques uh, carry, on, carry on to uh, c CDs, DVDs? Uh, and as you know, those do not seem to have lasted as many years, many of them as, as floppy disks have to every, everyone's surprise. Um, uh, the, the answer is yes. I mean, if you can get at an analog waveform early in the, the, the player's um, tr um, chain of, of transforms that it uses to make digital data out of out of an analog waveform, because everything's analog at, at the end of the day, then yes, these techniques do apply. Um, I believe there was a project where someone was doing this with laser discs. And th there's a, there's a, is, is, that, is that you? Yeah. 
we have a gentleman in the audience who's done that with laser discs. I've, I've read, I, it's almost certainly your work that I've read then, whereby, uh, you know, you, you know the, the earlier in the read chain of a laser disc, presumably there's some analog signal coming off, and if you get at that, you, you get the peaks, and you can do a better job at resolving them than 1980s tech. <laughs> So in defense, in defense of the CDRs and DVDRs that are dying, they actually, most of them did have a 10 year lifespan by, by design. There was special media designed for long term archival purposes, worm media, and that stuff doesn't degrade. So it might not be the same thing because it may be a little more difficult to recover because they were actually designed to degrade after a certain number of years. I was in that world a long time ago. We have another question here. Yes. Um, so, in developing these techniques, were there any uh, was there any cross pollination with efforts to recover data from old tape? Was there any cross pollination to um, with efforts to recover old data from tapes? Um, uh, no, not that I not that I can recall. Uh, that said, someone did mention that uh, last year there was a, a talk here on this sort of thing for recovery for tapes, and it's on my list to go and find that if it's on YouTube, hopefully, and, and watch that and see if there could be any cross-pollination and, and reach out if appropriate. 